Hello, my friends, and welcome. It is time to gather around the Sutra campfire. We're going to dive in. When last we left our heroes, we had just finished Sutra 2.9. So we will pick up with 2.10. And this is full of some really interesting stuff. Um, so we have some conversations about karma. We have some conversations about what it means to um, be connected to your divine nature. And and some explanations for why the world is as it is. Very interesting. So come on in and join me. So just a little summary. When last we left our heroes, and we'll just start with Pada 2, okay? So in Pada 2, they started off by saying, hey, yoga is a combination of tapas, svadhyaya, and ishvari pranidhanani. That is intensity, surrender to God, and self-study. And when you do this, you will reduce the kleshas. Kleshas, what's a klesha? A klesha is an obstacle. And the obstacles to the practice of yoga are ignorance. Now, ignorance isn't just ignorance like, oh my gosh, I don't know what the capital of Morocco is. No, ignorance is ignorance over our true nature. So the great mistake, as we might call it, is when I think that me, this material body, this instrument of the senses that I have, is the same thing as the seer, as the presence. So you can ask yourself like, who is looking out of my eyes? There is a sense of presence that is this great witness to your experience. But we get confused, right? And we think that who we are is all the stuff in our head, it's all of the thoughts we have, all the feelings we have, all the emotions that we have. We're like, this is who I am, right? Rather than realizing that actually we're the one watching the movie of the of our lives like our 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 lives are a big soap opera and we usually think we're in the soap opera rather than realize no i'm just watching this unfold and this goes back to patanjali's first definition of yoga yoga chitta vritti narodaha yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations of the mind stuff because then you know who you truly are when you're not caught up in all those thoughts and the feelings otherwise you think you're all that stuff as i call it the hamsters so Back to the kleshas, Patanjali's saying there are five kleshas and the first one is ignorance. And he's like, again, folks, I'm just saying, when you don't realize that you are the witness and not the soap opera, that's when, that's when you run into problems. That's an obstacle. And he says all the other obstacles can be traced back to that fundamental mistake. The other obstacles are egoism. I am a yogi, I am a doctor, I am a mother, I am, um, you know, an accountant, whatever your identification is. He's like, that egoism, that sense of selfness, of I amness, you know, is, is also um, an illusion. There's also an error being made there. Your attraction to things, your aversion to things, which are based on your experiences, are also obstacles. You know, if we're caught up in wanting our coffee or you know, wanting sex or wanting drugs or wanting alcohol or wanting a great career, all of that attraction um, and desire for things is an obstacle. Similarly, aversions to things as well. The yogi would be more dispassionate or have a sense of equanimity in the face of things that are likes and dislikes or pleasurable and painful. And then finally, fear of death, which the yogis say, even in the wise, this is normal. So we have avidya, ignorance. We have egoism, attraction, aversion, and fear of death or clinging to life. Those are all of the obstacles to the practice. So here's our first new sutra, 2.10. And I like this translation. When these obstacles, um, or the subtle causes of suffering, which are these obstacles that we just talked about, ignorance, egoism, attraction, aversion, clinging to bodily life. These subtle causes are destroyed when the mind merges back into the unmanifest. So that is when we are meditating, when the mind returns back to the sense of presence, when we resolve everything back to presence and being the witness, then those dissipate. And haven't you noticed that to be true? So. Okay, let's say you're going to a yoga practice and uh, like, okay, if it's me, I'm always jonesing for coffee or for something, right? So I'm like anxious, I'm jittery, I feel like I need to go, I don't know if you heard that, that was thunder. I feel like I need to go to, to work or, or kind of do my to-do list. Like I'm, I'm all keyed up, right, in my thoughts. After yoga practice, a great meditation or shavasana, 
those urges, those obstacles aren't as present, right? That's probably one of the reasons, the main reasons that we actually do yoga is because of that sense of equanimity, we're less drawn into all of that soap opera story stuff, right? We're less drawn into our need for something or our dislike of something. And that happens because we have connected ourselves more to the sense of being the presence and the witness. We've gotten rid of some of that drama and noise. Two eleven, two eleven. in their active state. So that means when you are in the throes of a desire or a resistance, fear, or you know, a real sense of ego, he says, meditate. In their active state, they can be destroyed by meditation. So if you're all keyed up, go to your mat, do your practice, and it dissipates. And we know this to be true. We've done this ourselves. 2.13. Okay, these next few are about karma. And I'll be totally honest with you here. I haven't done a lot of studying on karma, but I think we can think of karma as the residue of the cycle of cause and effect. So there is, when we take an action, um, there is kind of this like residue that happens. And, and I think of this in, from a neurological perspective where we think of, you know, things that fire together, wire together, our neurons in our head. When we've done something, there's an imprint that happens. And if we do that thing a lot, the imprint increases and increases and increases. This is just the way that our minds work and it becomes harder to not do that thing. Have you noticed that? If you always go the same way to work, it feels really weird when you don't go that way to work. If I always have a cup of coffee in the morning, you bet my brain and my nervous system is clamoring at me to have my cup of coffee. So I think that this is kind of the spiritual um, viewpoint of something that we understand is neurologically true. So when we do the same thing, the same actions, and we, there's a, a residue or a result from that, or we might think a groove that is created that, help, that makes us fall into that more easily. And so Patanjali says, the womb of karmas, so th this residue or these kind of this, this stickiness has its root in these obstacles. So back to the coffee thing, if I always want the coffee and I keep doing that, I'm creating some karma. I'm creating some stickiness around that particular desire. Or I could create stickiness around a particular aversion. Or we create stickiness around our identity, don't we? If, if, if I'm really attached, I used to be really attached to the fact that I, I was like, I got good grades in school. And I was really attached to that. And if you know people asked me who I was, I'd be like, I am the person who did well in school, you know, and I was very proud of that. And that became a sticky identity that actually got in the way of me just being present, right? Because it's kind of like these identities sort of clamor at us to own them. So what Patanjali is saying is that this karma that we're creating, this stickiness or this residue has its roots in these obstacles this fundamental mistaking of our self for our thoughts and our feelings, our desire to anchor our identity to something, our liking of something, our avoiding of things, or fear of death, all of that is what is creating this karma, and the karma is what keeps pulling us back life after life. Because you just can't get rid of all that karma in one lifetime, even though lots have tried, it's tricky, so that's what kind of keeps pulling us back into this great wheel of experience. Sutra 213, as long as action leaves its seed in the mind, this seed will grow, generating more births, more lives, more actions. So basically, you guys, even if you aren't act, this is key, even if you aren't actively, even though I'm not actively out there in the world drinking coffee, if there's still the seed of that attraction for coffee, that's still some karma in there, right? So even if I sat in meditation my whole life, if I still have those seeds, for the desire or the aversion, even if that's still percolating, 
that's karma and that's gonna bring me back and that's gonna bear fruit. So there's a lot of seed and fruit here. There's a seed, it's gonna bear fruit. How do we eradicate the seeds is the question, right? <laughs> so even if I'm not actively pursuing all of these things I want, drinking all the wine, watching all the Netflix, indulging all of my senses, um, if I want to, I'm not out of the woods yet. Sutra 214. So experiences of pleasure and pain are the fruits of merit and demerit, respectively. Hmm. Let's read another translation. The karmas bear fruit of pleasure and pain caused by merit and demerit. Hmm. Another translation. In these two, the fruit of wrong action is sorrow. The fruit of right action is joy. Okay. So basically, you know, the fruit of wrong action. So if I'm taking an action and it's not meritous, it's not an integral action, I may feel sorrow from that. So there's a seed and a fruit happening. Or if I take right action, I will feel joy. So yay. But we might think that's good. We'd be like, well, I'll just always take right action. But even that, folks, is karma. As we'll see in the next sutra, which says, to one of discrimination, this is 2.15, and this one's interesting. To one of discrimination, everything is painful. So that thing about getting joy from right action, mm -mm. even that's painful, everybody, because um, the anxiety and fear over losing what is gained, the resulting impressions left in the mind that create renewed cravings, and the constant conflict amongst the three gunas which control the mind. Oh my gosh, there's no way out. So what they're saying is that even if you take right action, even though right action is better than wrong action, because wrong action creates sorrow, which is a little bit yuckier, so yes, take right action. But they're saying even that ultimately is a problem because say we do something good, then all of a sudden we're attached to the fact that we got something good out of that. We're afraid of, of losing that good thing. Um, or we become attached to how we feel relative to that good thing. Or we, how many of you have done this? You're in, the, you're in the first flush of falling in love. It's like, you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so good. And then what do you do? You get scared and you worry because you're like, when is it going to end? Is it going to be over? Are we going to have fights, right? So even in things that are good, seemingly, we can create anxiety about them. And also, at some point, everything changes. So the yogis recognized that everything in this world, this prakriti, this material world, which is governed by the gunas, which are the forces of nature, all of it's moving all the time. So even if I have this great relationship now, you bet your bottom dollar at some point you're gonna have a fight. And if you were attached to how nice it was, you're gonna be really disappointed when you run into some obstacles, and you will. So what Patanjali is saying is that to someone who is discriminating, that is recognizes that all of this is temporary and all of this is changeable, that even something nice has in it the seeds of pain because at some point it's going to end. Mm, it's kind of true, right? This is, the, this is the nature of the world that we live in. But what we can do, and what I take from this sutra, is that even though we're not enlightened yet, probably not, um, <laughs> what we can do is when we have something that's wonderful, you know, we're spending quality time with our family, we're taking a beautiful walk outside, we are falling in love, something that brings us joy or an accomplishment is to recognize is, is to recognize the ephemerality of that moment, is to recognize that it's just one of the waves that's going to come so we don't get too attached to it. I say, experience it fully, have a great time, but also recognize, recognize that there is going to be a time where it's not there. And in that way, recognizing the temporality of everything, you know, can make it more precious. It, it brings us even more into the exquisiteness of that moment because we know that it's going to change. Two sixteen. This one's a good one. Pain that is not yet come is avoidable. Okay, so that has to do a little bit with the last one, which is to say, like, if I get attached to something, and <clears throat> I start to identify with having that thing, 
right? If I get caught up in that, then when it goes, I'm gonna be in pain. But if I have discrimination and I recognize that that's lovely, but it's gonna go away, then when it does go away, I don't have pain because I didn't put unreasonable expectations on this thing to solve all my problems. So this is asking us to be self-sufficient, my friends. So you know we do this, it's like we think when I get that thing, car, job, person, kid, whatever it might be, I will be complete and I will be, ah, I will feel good. And we do feel good for a moment, but if we get attached to it, bet your bottom dollar, that thing is gonna go away at some point and then we're devastated and we lose ourselves. Wouldn't it be better, friends at home, wouldn't it be better if we could get that thing, you know, whatever it might be, relish it with the understanding, the greater perspective that all will change. So I don't need it to fill me. I can enjoy it while it lasts. And when it goes away, oh, nah. I might've preferred it to stay around, but it doesn't, I don't lose my sense of center from that. We attach ourselves so often to these identities that are necessarily temporary rather than enjoying the opportunity of expressing ourselves, and this is more of a tantric idea, I would say, but than a Patanjali idea, but rather than enjoy the expression and the manifestation of our energy in the world with the recognition that things will expand, things will contract, things will come and things will go, we get so attached to holding on to that one thing because we're afraid that if we lose it, we lose ourselves. If we can stay in the seat of the witness, recognize that we are that unchanging presence who's living out this story, then we can take the roller coaster ride with a little bit more grace and a lot more resilience. Sutra 217. The cause of that avoidable pain is the union of Purusha with Prakriti. So in other words, the reason that you got upset is because you mistook your soul for the soap opera. You were trapped in all the thoughts and the feelings and you thought that's who you were. So again, the reason that, that you started hurting is because you made the great mistake. You attached your identity to something that was fleeting and not really who you were. Okay, this one is curious and I've never really read it this way before so I'm excited to share this with you. This is 218. Sachidananda writes, the scene is of the nature of the gunas. Okay, so the material world, the sensory world is prakriti, right? Is the nature of the gunas. The gunas are sattva, tamas, and I know this, rajas. Oh my gosh. So the three gunas are sattva, tamas, rajas. That's basically like illumination and purity, the absence of the other two. Tamas is like inertia, slowing down. Rajas is speeding up. All of these things are... I think it's like electrons, it's like what powers the world, it's speeding up or slowing down or staying the same. This is the nature of the gunas. So th it's the nature of change and it's what makes the world happen. It might happen slowly, it might be a mountain slowly crumbling or it might be fast like the ocean coming through. But these energies are all at play in the world. So the gunas consist of the elements hmm, and the sense organs whose purpose is to provide both experiences and liberation to the Purusha. Okay, hold the phone here. Let's take that one again. The gunas, this world of Prakriti, right? Its purpose is to provide experiences and liberation for Purusha. We're like, why are we here in this material world if I'm supposed to get caught up in it, if there's lots of suffering, blah, 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 to provide experiences and liberation for Purusha, your soul. Okay, this is like a hidden, this is like a hidden cavern in the Yoga Sutras. Because in this sutra, Patanjali is actually describing like why the world is. Like why why not just be soul, right? Why just be why why aren't we just consciousness? Like why is there a world at all? To provide experience and liberation. So it's only through these experiences that we gain wisdom and ultimately can gain the liberation of being a soul and in relationship to the world, rather than caught up in it all, right? Experiences and liberation. This is amazing. So why the world is here? So you can practice and practice finding equanimity in relationship to the craziness of this world that's run by the gunas and be liberated in yourself from that. And that is heaven on earth, my friends.
2.19. Satchitananda talks about the gunas. He says they can be um, specific, non-specific, defined, or undefinable. I think this is basically saying like you have these three gunas and they can be manifest, they could be latent, you know, they could be subtle. It's just kind of saying that they're not just always active and out there. Sometimes they're hidden, you know, sometimes they're more subtle. Um, sometimes they're just a little seed waiting to happen and sometimes they're not even manifest yet. So, you know, do you know the, there's a, um, uh, an Upanishad about Om and Om has four stages and it's like, um, or Om describes the four stages of the, of basically the cycle of life, which is unmanifest and then, you know, manifest, flourishing, and then leaving. And that, it's, this kind of reminds me of that. It's just saying that there's a cycle to the gunas and, you know, they're not always active. Sutra 2 to 20, the seer, Purusha, is nothing but the power of seeing, which although pure, appears to see through the mind. So we're just kind of drawing a distinction. Again, he's kind of repeating the same story, you guys. There's Purusha and there's the mind, and Purusha, your soul, your witness, illuminates the contents of the mind, but is not the mind. We've heard this before. This is a refrain. 221, another secret gem. The scene exists only for the sake of the seer. Here we go, here's that thing. The world, the manifest world, Prakriti, exists only for the sake of the soul, so that it can be liberated. Oh, it's amazing. 222, <laughs> okay, this one's funny. He says, Although the world, the manifest world, if once you achieve liberation, the world goes away, it's still around because there's plenty of people who aren't liberated yet. Basically, the world, this material world is common to all of us who are still just living in our shit. So even though you're liberated, it goes away for you. It's going to stay around for everybody else. I think that's just funny. 223, here again is another little insight into why the world is. Um, the self is obscured, the true self, Purusha, is obscured by the world in order that the reality of both might be discovered. So the, this is like, if we're asking ourselves, why do we suffer? Why are we confused? He, he, here it is, you gotta work supermodel, right? It's, you have to work to become liberated and that's why we have the world. And the mind and our ego obscures this natural relationship that we have of being soul and the material world. The mind obscures all of that, but it's for the sake that we can actually start to know what they are. So, Patanjali is basically telling us why we're here. And of course, coming back to our refrain of the great mistake, he can't say it too many times, folks. The cause, um, the reason that the self is obscured is because of the ignorance in our mind. Again, great mistake. The reason that we suffer is because we mistake who we are for the stuff around us. Two twenty-five. When we're liberated, we're not confused about that anymore. Two twenty-six. The way that we attain that discrimination or that insight is by practicing constantly. Two twenty-seven, and to the person who's not confused about that, you will have a sevenfold layer of insight. And the Patanjali doesn't list what these kind of insights are, but Satchitananda offers what they are or what the result of that is. So I'll just tell you what he says. Sometimes these things are implied. It's like everybody knew it, so you didn't write it down. But they say there's a sevenfold um, version of wisdom or stages of wisdom. And so what you experience when you have reached wisdom is one. Um, you don't have a desire to know anything more. You're like, I'm good. You don't have a desire to stay away from anything. So you're not, you don't need to be averse to anything. You don't have the desire to gain anything. You, you're not attracted to anything. You don't have the desire to do anything and you don't have any sorrow, fear, or delusion. So that's what liberation looks like, everybody. Now, we're gonna pause our sutra exploration here because the next piece of our sutras is super fun and these are the eight limbs. So 
uh, these it's called ashtanga the eight limbs of yoga not to be confused with patabi joyce's ashtanga yoga but this is the ashtanga yoga of patanjali and it's super fun to dig into and really really juicy and great so that'll be in our next installment so there you go everybody that's been our voyage into the sutras to 9 through 227 so lots of juicy stuff in there about karma and why we're here and what the gunas are and how we achieve liberation but one thing i want your takeaway to be you'll notice patanjali repeats himself a lot he's constantly saying hey ignorance is when you think you're all your thoughts and your feelings and basically everything bad happens from that and when you don't have that anymore everything is liberated and joyful so you guys, you're just going to notice that there are similar refrains. He's really driving his point home because, you know, we're still reading, so we haven't gotten it yet. So that concludes our Sutra Campfire for today. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe for more tips. I'd love to hear from you. Do you have alternate translations that you like? Did any of these resonate with you in a particular way? Which ones did you like? Which ones did you not like? Um, just put them in the comments below. And thank you for hanging in there.